The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, and welcome back to The Learning Circuit. We have finally started diving into learning about alternating current. In this video, I'm going to assemble a function generator and then use it to show you different types of AC waves on my oscilloscope. Let's get started. I found this kit online. It's capable of generating sine, triangle, and square waves with adjustable amplitude and frequency range of 1 hertz to 1 megahertz. Let's assemble the kit and then we can look at how it works. I've got all the components laid out here and as usual with these kits, it's best to start with the lowest profile parts and work up. That means starting with the resistors. There's R1 through R8, but three of those are adjustable resistance potentiometers. Those will be safe for last. The five remaining fixed resistors are one 1K, one 330 ohm, and three 5.1K. Can't forget safety. Okay, let's start with R1. R1 is the 1K resistor. So R3, R5, and R6 are the remaining 5.1 kilo ohm resistors. Next, we have the five non-polarized ceramic capacitors. C2 is 104, C5 is 105, C6 is the 473, C7 is the 222, and C8 is the 101. You can see from the traces on the back of the board that each of these capacitors connects to one pin on the pin headers here. This pin header will be used to set the frequency range of the generator, so these capacitors determine those frequency ranges. Okay, next is the IC socket. I want to make sure that the notch lines up with that on the PCB here. I'm going to start by soldering just two of the pins and making sure that I'm pushing the socket so that it's flush to the board and then I'll go back and solder the rest of the pins. Next is the electrolytic capacitors. With these I have to mine the polarity. The hole with the hashed lines is for the negative lead. That's the shorter one with the line on the side of the cap. Matching the size of the circles, C1 is the fatter one, the 100 microfarad cap, and the other two are both the same value, the smaller holes, they are 10 microfarads. Let's solder them in place. Everything's a rave today. Oh, gotta mind that polarity. I'm minding which way I bend my leads so I don't accidentally short pins together that should not be connected. Moving on, we have the two sets of header pins. Again, I want to make sure that both of these end up flush and do that without burning myself. Okay. Now it's time for the three pin screw terminal to connect the signal wires for the output. Make sure the screw inputs go out to the side. Now the power jack, and I need to make sure that this is on straight because the case fits fairly tightly around it. I'm trying to bend all of these tabs in really well. Uh, I don't want to have to trim them because they create, they provide like physical, mechanical reinforcement for this plug that's going to be, see a lot of plugging and unplugging. So I got to make sure those are still there, but low profile. Mm -hmm. 
So last is the three potentiometers. Two are 50K labeled B503 and one is 100K labeled B104. I'm gonna flood the crap out of these pads. Whee! So they're nice and solid. Get those pins down, but also have like a nice solid plate of solder to hold these guys in place. You can see on the edge of the board here that R2 is the amplitude adjustment, R7 is the fine adjustment pot, and R8 is the coarse adjustment pot. Hopefully you can see that. Last is to put the IC in place. Now you might need to use some needle nose to straighten out the pins, or you might need to press this against the edge of the table like that there to make sure that they are aligned properly with the socket. Again, you wanna make sure that you are aligning the notch on the chip with the notch on the socket. Don't be confused by the extra dots on the surface. This is the dot for pin one. That is there to confuse you. Okay, all my soldering is done, so now it's time to put the case together. The case is made of laser cut acrylic and the face has been etched, but since the acrylic is clear, those markings will be hard to read. So I'm going to use a paint pen to make them white and hopefully more legible. Uh, in the corners of the bottom are little partially cut out pieces that the screws are going to go into that hold the case together. So I can pop those out with a little screwdriver. Driver. The last thing to do is to turn all of the knobs left and add little knobs here for the three potentiometers. And then we need to add the two jumpers. The eight pin header here is used to select the frequency range. Back in our lesson for ultrasonic sensors, we looked at the audio frequency spectrum and learned that human hearing has a frequency range of around 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. The lower the frequency, the lower pitch the sound. So let's start at the low end of that and put the jumper to select 10 to 100 hertz. To access the waveform output, wires can be connected to these screw terminals. One output wire gives access to a square wave, while the other output gives access to a triangle or sine wave, which are chosen by placing a jumper on this header here. All waveform outputs share a ground wire. This kit doesn't come with a power supply, but can run off of anywhere between nine and 12 volts, being sure not to exceed 12 volts. So I'm just using a standard barrel jack, nine volt power supply I have lying around. Now the kit doesn't have a power switch, so I'm not going to plug it in until I'm ready. Okay, time for the oscilloscope. I'm gonna start by looking at a square wave. So I will hook up my probe to the square wave wire, being sure to connect Ground. Okay, so uh, on my scope here, I've got my square wave showing. If I turn the amplitude knob, it does nothing. But I can adjust woo, my fine adjustment knob, or I can adjust my coarse adjustment knob to adjust the frequency. So you can see that the waves are getting closer together left to right, being more frequent over time. Or if I turn it, the knob to the left, become less frequent over time. And I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my second lead. I have the jumper set on my triangle wave. So we're looking at my blue signal here. If I adjust the amplitude knob, it can change the size of the triangle wave. Now, if I turn this too far, uh, you can see the triangle wave actually gets a bit clipped. So I'm gonna go ahead, turn that back so it looks more triangle. Let's adjust that frequency. Oh yeah. It's a coarse knob, make big changes. The fine knob to make small changes. Oh, cool. 
All right, I'm gonna switch the jumper from the triangle wave to the sine wave. Uh, and you can see all that pretty much does is just kind of rounds off the top of that wave. It still kind of looks like a triangle wave. The uh, wider this gets, the more signy it looks. Now, since I mentioned that this frequency range happens to be in the audible range, I'm gonna hook up a speaker so you can hear what these waves sound like. Okay, to get to a better audible range, I had to switch to 100 to 3 kilohertz. A triangle wave generates the best audio, so that's what I have hooked up. I'll try to crank up my mic so you can hear the sound. You can see with the jumper back at 10 to 100 hertz, I have to turn the pots almost completely up to get it to a more audible range. So the lower the frequency, the deeper the sound, the harder it is to hear, the more amplification you need. Uh, you might also be able to see that the sharper the wave gets on the triangle wave, the sharper the sound gets. Let me crank up my mic again so you can see. Okay, I wanna show you one more thing. In the past, when I've used a 555 timer to make a timing circuit, it would have generated a square wave. So I can hook up LEDs to make them flash and can adjust the frequency of the wave to adjust the timing of the flashing of the LED. Now I moved the frequency jumper down to the lowest frequency so that you get a slower flash rather than a strobe. Well, I have shown you how I can use my function generator to create sound and how to use it as a timing circuit. But what other uses can you come up with for using a triangle, sine, or square wave? How else can it be helpful to be able to generate an alternating current with a controllable frequency and amplitude? Post your ideas and comments on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash the learning circuit. You can find me there as Maker Karen. Happy learning.